of them. My name is Kathleen Hardington Kennedy Townsend. Okay, are you comfortable in that chair? Oh, my ass is asleep and my back hurts. If you can look at me when we're talking. Oh my God. I know, no, I'm so no, sorry. No, 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 <laughs> say it ain't no. so. You're doing so great. Thank you. I need a lot of encouragement. Yeah, beautiful. If you could just give me a standing ovation every once in a while. You know, Mommy has said that she, of course, that she considered being a nun. But before she married Daddy, she was... Of course, before she married Daddy. <laughs> <laughs> Mommy had 11 children. Well, her... She only had 10 children. No, she had 11 children. Kathleen Joe, Bobby, David Courtney, Michael Carey, Chris, Max Douglas. Rory. Oh, sorry. I always, I just always forget. <laughs> this is what it's like to be the 11th. Yeah. There's so many times in my life where people have said, I want to introduce Robert Kennedy's daughter. Oh, it makes me so mad. <laughs> what about the one who delivered us and carried us for nine months and then has been with us the last 40 years? Mommy and Daddy met in the winter of 1945. Daddy's sister, Jean Kennedy, and I were in college together. Jean and I plotted that we would bring our families together uh, on a skiing vacation and went up to Mont Tremblant in Canada. Grandma Kennedy came, as did my parents. Uh, you skied in groups. I mean, there were always about, I don't know, at least 10 or more of us skiing together. And did the Skakels and the Kennedys get along well? They did, and eventually, each of the Skakel boys took out each of the Kennedy sisters. Growing up, my mother and father had childhoods that were in some ways remarkably similar and in other ways very different. Daddy was a Kennedy and grew up in a wealthy, large Irish Catholic family. The Kennedys were shaped by their culture. The Kennedys were shaped by their religion. And for them, that meant embracing the crowd. They were part of the fabric of the city. Mummy was a Skakel and also grew up in a wealthy, large Irish Catholic family. The Skakels were outdoors people and that love of nature, that comfort with mountains and streams and rivers, the forest, outdoor adventure. They were the great individualists. They were not conformists. They didn't want to be part of something bigger than themselves. But whereas Daddy's father, Joseph Kennedy, went to Harvard, and Daddy's mother, Rose, was the daughter of the mayor of Boston, Mommy's father, George Skakel, was a self-made man who started off working for only $8 a week. He worked for the railroad, and I don't know how he saved the money, but he started a coal company. It was amazing because he hadn't been to college. Grandpa ultimately grew Great Lakes Carbon into one of the largest private family businesses in the United States. The Kennedy household, whether in Brookline or Palm Beach, was very disciplined. Dinner was at 7.15, and it did not mean 7.16. The Skakel home in Greenwich was more chaotic. And our house, you didn't know whether you were going to have supper at 5 or 10. My brothers were real rascals. For instance, they would take the train to New York, but they never rode on the inside of the train. They always rode on the top of the train. I mean, they made life really fun and interesting and a challenge. And they were plenty scary, too. Both families were very religious. Both families said evening prayer. All of our grandparents went to daily mass. The people of America are dedicated to the cause of peace. The Kennedys were staunch Democrats and politically very active. The Skakels, on the other hand... My parents weren't bedrock Democrats. <laughs> they were Republicans. Conservative Republicans. Did you have any consciousness of politics when you were growing no, up? No, none whatsoever. Both families were athletic. Mummy was a natural. Mummy is the most fiercely competitive person I've ever met in my entire life. Mummy competed in riding, competed in sailing, was really a champion. Daddy, on the other hand, was physically the smallest of his brothers and had to try a little harder. Daddy was regarded as the run to the litter, but he was very tough. And when he went to Harvard, he worked his way up to first strength on the football team. 
and he made it by showing up an hour early to practice and staying an hour late. Didn't he play the Harvard-Yale game to get his letter? Yes, and he had a broken leg. He had a cast on his leg. So what does that say to you about Daddy's character, that he was playing this game when he had a broken leg? He really wanted to get his letter. <laughs> Whereas Daddy liked to stick to the rules, Mummy liked to bend them. Mummy's a skakel, and as a skakel, she inherited a healthy disregard for authority in all its forms. As your mother, I probably shouldn't uh, tell you this, but every morning at college, even at college, imagine that, from 8.30 to 9, I read the odds about the racetrack. If only my tests had been on the racehorses instead of history. <laughs> I would really have gotten an A+. Plus. Now you read the New York Times every day. Yes. I wasn't a very deep thinker, like I am now. <laughs> you and Aunt Jean got into a little bit of trouble. Uh, no, they never caught us. OK, well, I have proof. <laughs> you do not. You do not. I have the demerit book. Do you remember this demerit book? I can remember a demerit book. Uh, I got censured for talking at assembly and chewing gum. And disorder in the tea room. This is ridiculous. We wanted to go to the Harvard-Yale game, but if you had racked up a certain amount of demerits, you, know, you were campused. So we took the demerit book and threw it down the incinerator and went to the Harvard-Yale game. So what happened on that skiing trip to Mont Tremblant when my mother and father met for the very first time? He was standing in front of a roaring fireplace in the living room. And what did you think when you saw him? Wow. Pretty great. Really? Yeah. So was it love at first sight? It was. Really? It was. We yeah. made a bet right away about who could get down the mountain faster. And who won? I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> 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 and then Daddy took a left turn and he started dating my sister ah. oh that was a black period but at the time i thought well no contest she's so pretty and so smart and so wonderful and so they went out for two years oh ouch, ouch. <laughs> luckily the Boston Post asked Daddy to cover the War of Independence in Israel. And so when he went off to what was then called Palestine, Pat found Lewin Cuff and fell in love with him so that when he returned, Mummy could get him. Who can fight and fight till he wins? Kennedy can. Kennedy can. Mummy's first exposure to politics came in 1946, while she was still at Manhattanville College. Her roommate, Jean Kennedy, took her to Boston to help my Uncle Jack's very first campaign for Congress. That was really fun. We'd drive up to Boston and then lick stamps. And I thought, this is so exciting. We went house to house and talked to people and why they would listen to her. 17-year-old who knew nothing, I have no idea. But it was great experience. It was a room full of people who I had not exactly rubbed elbows with before. A lot of minorities and financially challenged people. So did you start thinking during this campaign of that they're faced with a lot of hardship and struggle and yes. if government can help them, that's a good thing? Yeah. Can you talk about that? No. Oh. <laughs> All this introspection, I hate it. Her first love and her great love was Daddy. So whatever Daddy was, she was going to like. She was not uh, James Carville and Mary Madeline. She was. She believed that the woman stayed with the guy. And I think that being with Daddy certainly opened her up to other experiences. And she saw what a difference she could make. We got married in Greenwich, and it was a beautiful wedding. It was wonderful. 
and there were about 600 guests, and there were fountains of champagne. Lots of dancing, lots of dogs all over everything. And I think Daddy had 21 ushers. <laughs> he had a lot of friends. Yeah. We went on our honeymoon in Hawaii, and then we went back to L.A. and uh, bought a convertible and drove across the country. It was just will of the wisp. We'd go to Montana, and then we'd go down to a southern state. We went where, wherever we had friends. It was a very happy time. In the book, Robert Kennedy and His Times, the historian Arthur Schlesinger wrote this about Daddy's relationship with Mummy. For Robert Kennedy, it was the best thing that could have happened. She awakened his sympathy and his humor and brought him out emotionally. He never had to prove himself to her. Ethel gave him unquestioning confidence, unwavering direction, and unstinted love. They made their way back to Virginia, where Daddy was finishing his final year at the University of Virginia Law School. Mummy tried her hand at homemaking. I was really bad at it. Can you describe Mummy as a homemaker? No. She, she was a horrible cook. I remember one night she put some Vaseline, like petroleum jelly, in a frying pan and cooked bananas. That was not why he fell in love with her, her <laughs> cooking. While at UVA Law School, Daddy headed the Student Legal Forum, an organization that brought important speakers to campus. One of the speakers he invited was Dr. Ralph Bunch, who was the first person of color to win the Nobel Peace Prize. At the time, UVA was still segregated, and much of the local community and student body were angered by Dr. Bunch's impending visit. Everyone agreed that the safest, imagine having to use the word safe, is so appalling. Uh, the safest place for him to stay was at our house. And he was so charming and non-complaining. But they did throw things at our house all night long. It was so unthinkable and outrageous. But you got a little taste of what black people in our country had to go through at that time. And I was glad I was married to Daddy, who had the courage and the forethought to have someone of color speak at Charlottesville. After graduating from law school, Daddy got a job at the Department of Justice. But he was there only briefly. Uncle Jack had decided to run for the Senate and asked Daddy to manage his campaign. It was a major decision. He had felt he was just starting his own career mm -hmm. and that he had to put it on the back burner. It was a big sacrifice. It was wonderful that he did it. And why did he make that choice? Well, because he loved his brother. Everybody in our family banded together to help, and Mummy did her part, too. She and Aunt Pat and Aunt Eunice and Aunt Jean and my grandmother had famous tea parties across the state, and they would invite hundreds of women from the neighborhood, and people would come to meet the Kennedy girls. The tea parties were fun because Pat and Jean and Eunice were there. you just meet hundreds of people and shake hundreds of hands. By the end of the campaign, she had probably met every voter in the entire congressional district. My brother Bobby, who managed the campaign, perhaps he could give us some idea more up to date of what the final figures were. I think that uh, from what we got uh, up to about 20 minutes ago, that they were winning by about 70,000, about 100,000 more votes would come in. I think that that plurality would be many. Very fine. Well, I'm just you're glad it's over, aren't you, Bobby? I am, Jack. Okay. Uncle Jack won his seat in the Senate. After the race, the Republican candidate, Henry Cavett Lodge, blamed his loss on those damn tea parties. In 1953, Daddy went to work for the Senate Subcommittee on Investigations, chaired by Joseph McCarthy. The raw, unpleasant fact is that communism is an issue. You know, it's hard now, looking back, to understand the sense of what the communist threat was in this country, but did you right. feel like there was a real threat at the yes, time? Yes, I did especially growing up in a Republican atmosphere. They were always talking about the communists. 
My grandfather had been friends of, with McCarthy by virtue that they were both Irish Catholics. And uh, McCarthy had actually dated two of my aunts, Pat and Eunice. He could be so affectionate and warm and then get in that hearing room. And um, it was very unpleasant how he treated people. He started drinking and the whole thing was just falling apart. And Daddy realized he didn't want to be a part of it. We stayed on the committee for a couple of months, and he quickly broke with McCarthy and helped author the report that was used in the end to censure McCarthy. Have you no sense of decency, sir, at long last? Have you left no sense of decency? Daddy was quoted as saying, at the time, I thought there was a serious internal security threat to the United States. McCarthy seemed to be the only one who was doing anything about it. I was wrong. He often changed his mind. Daddy had an open mind. He judged things continuously. On the 4th of July in 1951, Mummy gave birth to the very first of the Kennedy grandchildren, my sister, Kathleen. Daddy was the seventh of the nine children, and yet he has the first grandchild. Our family grew very quickly. My brother Joe was born next, then Bobby in 1954, David in 1955, and Courtney in 1956. You were pregnant for 99 months out of your life. <laughs> well, that is a statistic that I never, <laughs> this is the first time I've heard it. Obviously, you went on to have 11 children, so do you have any sense that you wanted a big family? Or yes. Did you guys talk about how many kids you would have? Did you have any? No, never. When I first went to Hickory Hill, it was owned by Jack and Jackie. And when I was about five or six years old, Daddy and Mommy actually bought Hickory Hill, and we moved there. And it was really in the country. Georgetown was kind of confining with all their children. Right. And there they had the lawn. And they could run, 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 run. We had a pony and a cart, and I'd take the children out for a ride every day. They'd go out in the snow, and behind them, on a, we had a sled that they could ride in. The word that comes first, of course, is magical, because our mother has an amazing imagination. So there was always something going on to interest us, all these children. Mommy and Daddy brought in a lot of horses. We would get up early in the morning and ride over to the CIA, which was nice. She thought we should know about farm animals and how they lived. And uh, so we had goats and pigs and cows and chickens. And they never were penned very well. So they'd spend a lot of time up in the uh, living room, particularly the goats who liked the flowers. And so it was fun, because you'd be walking up to the front door, and a herd of horses would come galloping by. So it was, <laughs> it was kind of unusual. I remember having, like, 15 dogs when we were growing up. At one point, I think you guys had 19 dogs. But th that was my own life growing up. We always had at least 16 dogs. My mother, who really never skipped a carpool, one day uh, appeared to pick us up with the seal in the back seat. <laughs> he had to be fed fish every day, but he didn't like the eyes, so there were always hundreds of eyes around. Uh, that we could have done without, but he was fun, and he'd make all sorts of noises. <laughs> <laughs> he was a great seal, but when he pushed my sister Kathleen in the pool through a hula hoop on Christmas Day, that was when he was sent off to the Washington Zoo. <laughs> in the fall of 1955, Mummy received terrible news. Her parents were on their way to California when their plane crashed. Both of them were killed. It was hard on everybody. It was. She was incredibly devoted to her parents, and she was 27 or so years old, and you know, that was a tragic loss for her. Was Daddy supportive of you? Very. Very. I remember he was campaigning, and... Uh, 
I really felt it would be good to be with him. And God love him, he got off the train and drove home. He had to drive all the way through the night, and, and he did it. In certain circles, people deal with death all the time, and they deal with it in different ways. I think what mummy, um, how mummy has dealt with death, she's, you know, she does go to mass every day. You will always see her holding the rosary, but she certainly doesn't talk about it, and she doesn't discuss it, and she doesn't reflect on it. She, she wanted a lot of people around, and I would say not solitude. And I think that's how she got through a lot of the really, really tough things. Why, sir? In 1957, my father became chief counsel of the Senate's Labor Rackets Committee. The committee investigated criminal activities surrounding labor management relations. Did you say that SOB, I'll break his back? Who? You. I'll to who? To anyone. Probably the most famous case was Jimmy Hoffa, the labor organizer accused of hijacking the Teamsters Union. Well, whose back were you going to break, Mr. Hoffa? Thank you for your speech. I don't even know what I was talking about. I don't know what you're talking about. He thought the working man was getting a raw deal and that the Teamsters Union was corrupt and it was wrecking the lives of, of so many people. Mommy was there almost every day, supporting Daddy. Mommy thought it was really important that we understood what Daddy was up to. So, for instance, um, oftentimes, rather than take me to the uh, playground where we could go on the seesaw, she took me to the Senate Racket Committee hearings. And so some of my first words were, I refuse to answer that question on the grounds that it may tend to incriminate me. Well, I think it might have been a little over their heads, but uh, it gave them a taste, I think, of what their Daddy did. Uh, Mrs. Kennedy, uh, do you attend many of Bob's committee hearings? Oh, Mr. Merrill, I do, yes, um, most all of them. Does Bob ever strike you as a seemingly mild-mannered man for a rackets investigator? Well, I'm awfully surprised most of the time when he really keeps his temper. You know, when witnesses aren't telling the truth and being quite frank, or when they take the Fifth Amendment so often. I think it's really amazing that he does so well. I thought it was a courageous thing to do to go after racketeers, and particularly Hoffa. It had its consequences on the family. They had thrown acid into the eyes of a journalist from the New York Post, and they said, we're going to do the same to your children. They were trying to intimidate Daddy. And so there was a period of time when we were going to Our Lady of Victory School. We couldn't leave with all the other kids. We'd had to go up into the principal's office and wait for Mommy to pick us up because it was supposed to be too dangerous for us to be just to walk out of school. She was not afraid of that. She was not going to be turned around. She was not going to be made to hide. I think her inner skakel came out, and she was emboldened, and I think that helped my father through that difficult time. For president who's seasoned through and through. But that's a dog on In 1959, Daddy resigned from the Labor Rackets Committee to run Uncle Jack's campaign for president. Was it clear that Jack was going to run for president? Well, it was certainly clear to the family. You know, we talk about it over the dinner table. At what point exactly did you learn he was going to run? Oh, for God's sake, that was 50 years ago, 60 years ago. I have no idea. Once again, the family rallied and everyone hit the campaign trail. My mother played a very active role. This lovely little girl here, a mother of seven children, who has given birth to her own precinct. <laughs> hey, you have any news for us? No, I don't. <laughs> Well, listen, you've been out campaigning for your brother-in-law. Oh, Have you enjoyed it? it all? Oh, yes. How do the really kids like take it? it? Now, you have the seven children. What do they think of all this? Well, mostly they think it's taking an awful long time for Uncle Jack to be president. <laughs> we were part of that campaign, and we were involved in every aspect. We climbed the stop signs and, you know, and put Nixon stickers under the stop signs that said, Stop Nixon. We passed out buttons. We traveled across the country, and that was such a thrill for us. Daddy really wanted the children with him. So whenever we could, the children campaigned too. And, and I think the children really loved it. 
I remember a campaigning and there were special dresses we all wore, the Kennedy girl dresses, and we all put them on. I was a little kid, but you know, we wore them, very exciting to go campaigning. Coffee with the Kennedy. First, I'd like to uh, thank my wife, uh, Jackie, for presenting this program and also my sister Eunice and my brother's wife, Ethel, who were helping to answer the telephone this morning. I mean, it's interesting. You grew up in a Republican household, and now you're in this Democratic campaign for president. But I just totally put the Republican part behind me. And your family didn't care, the Skakels. I think they thought I was a little communist. I think that we have a great deal of work. I think that the work on registration... The 1960 election would be one of the closest in history. It was a grueling year for Daddy, who crisscrossed the country, campaigning nonstop. I really remember 1960 largely for Daddy's absence, particularly during the West Virginia primary. I mean, he just disappeared for like three months, and we just never saw him. Where were you on election night? I was here at the Cape, and we waited and waited and watched right in there. I don't think they knew about Jack till the early morning, but we had gone to bed. Well, Daddy stayed up for a long time. And so then you woke up? Just elated, happy, hallelujah. I mean, bravo. Then we all went over to the big house and had a photograph taken. Everyone was genuinely happy. Everybody had worked so hard. Is but it it's funny, nobody looked tired in the photograph. Everybody just looks happy. I was so full of joy knowing that the rest of the world would now know how great Jack was. And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. We went to his swearing in, and that was our first visit to the White House. And we went upstairs with Daddy and Mommy. We toured through the upper floors of the White House. Mommy took us up and showed us where John, who had just been born, and Caroline were going to live in the private quarters. And then we came back down and Daddy slid down the banister. He had us all slide down the banisters, and then we went and saw the bowling alley, and we went and, and jumped in the swimming pool. And then we tore through the corridors and the secret tunnels underneath the White House. Just, it was a moment in history, and yeah. it was, you know, you were kind of unaware of it at, at the time. But what fun, 50 years later. After Uncle Jack became president, he asked Daddy to serve as his attorney general. Daddy was reluctant. And I think people were questioning whether that was the best choice, whether he was the best choice. He has proven his ability in almost 10 years of public service as an attorney for the Justice Department and more recently as chief counsel of the Senate Labor Rackets Committee. Daddy felt so sheepish and so shy. The president had to say to him, don't you think you should comb your hair <laughs> before we go out? <laughs> How does being a brother of a president affect your role as a member of the cabinet? Well, I think it probably uh, makes it easier. I think uh, having the same uh, last name as the president of the United States helps probably. Some of my earliest memories are of when Daddy was Attorney General, and Mommy would pile six or seven of us into the back of a convertible with two or three dogs and a football and bring us down to the Justice Department. In his Justice Department office, there were drawings by all of us taped up onto the walls. And so it made us feel like we were important in his life, just as important as his work. The children were always included in everything we did. They could probably made them more interesting. There was just not much of a separation between grown-ups and children. Mommy believed very much that we should, you know, know what was going on. So every night at dinner, there would always be quizzes at our dinner table about current events or history. And so it was very important where you sat. Um, at the dinner table, because if you sat at mommy's right, you only had to read the front page. But as you went around the dinner table, as you can imagine, you really had to know what was going on. 
what we loved to do was go down to the FBI building and watch the sharpshooters at practice. At the time, the director of the FBI was J. Edgar Hoover, who was a man not known for his sense of humor or his love of children. And he um, particularly had this intense uh, clash with my father. One day, we were all over there watching the sharpshooters, and in the bottom of the FBI building, which is a little weird, they had a suggestion box, I don't know why. But anyway, so Mommy took out her telltale red pen, and she always only used a red pen, and um, wrote on a little card, get a new director. <laughs> which was, you know, if you have any idea who J. Edgar Hoover was at that time, I mean, he was an awful, horrible man. <laughs> and just to be able to stand up to him, there was an important lesson to me at a very, very young age. Well, we came home from school every day. We played a football game. <laughs> Mommy loved to play football, but only if she was on the winning side. You know, a lot of parents will let their kids, like, beat them at a sport, you know, to encourage them, and but she wouldn't do that. <laughs> that wasn't part of her parenting philosophy. Every time we did anything, it was about competition. And was coming in second okay? Only if you were the Shrivers. <laughs> <laughs> Trying hard didn't cut it. You know, people now say, oh, just try hard. No. <laughs> Win. That was important. Trying hard. Not part of the not part of the culture, as well as the idea that Kennedys don't cry. I mean, you cannot show weakness. You always had to be tough. I also remember falling off my horse and hurting my leg, and it took them about four days to realize that it might be broken and I should go to the hospital. Had you in fact broken your leg? Yes, <laughs> but I'm glad we're laughing. The 1960s were just a completely, really unique period in American history. There's sort of every 30 or 50 years, there's periods where, where, where there's enormous change or enormous growth. And Daddy was in the middle of all of that. During the Cuban Missile Crisis, Daddy spent virtually the entire time at the White House. And for the first couple of days, nobody knew what was going on, but then they announced it on TV, and everybody realized that, you know, the next day, we could all be dead. Within the past week, unmistakable evidence has established the fact that a series of offensive missile sites is now in preparation on the island of Cuba. The Cubans, along with their allies, the Russians, were installing nuclear missiles capable of first strike attacks on the United States. I can't imagine anything worse. It was on your mind all the time. Uh, where are the children? Should we come? Should we go? Daddy, who played an important role in the handling of the crisis, had to stay in Washington by President Kennedy's side. I just remember Mom and Dad got us together as a family. And uh, they said that there was a provision that allowed some officials, families, and their children to maybe be taken outside of the city to a place of safety. Daddy was going to have to stay in Washington, and of course, Mom would never have left him. What they wanted to know was how we all felt about leaving or staying together as a family. We all had to say what we wanted to do, and we all said that we wanted to stay. I think Bobby and I had maybe some second thoughts about it between ourselves afterwards. <laughs> I think if she'd said, hey, I'm getting the hell out of here, I know I'm not going to stick around Washington, it would have had a completely different effect on all of us. But when you see that kind of loyalty, you just suck it up. In his job as Attorney General, Daddy found himself at the forefront of the civil rights movement. The citizens are being denied the right to register and the right to vote because of their color. Mommy 
would make sure we understood the importance of those battles, the historical significance uh, of those battles, and that we talked about them. In 1962, the racial integration of the University of Mississippi had been violent. A year later, the University of Alabama was headed in the same direction. Today, the majority of the white population of Tuscaloosa still does not favor integration of the university. The state's governor, George Wallace, stood in the schoolhouse door in an effort to stop African-American students from entering. In the face of this, Daddy sent his deputy attorney general, Nick Katzenbach, down to Alabama to persuade the governor to let the students in. And I'm asking from you an unequivocal assurance that you will not bar entry to these students and that you will step aside peacefully. I was maybe three or four years old and I was in daddy's office and the phone rang and Nick Kassenbach was calling. He won't step aside. He'll be, he'll be carried off by soldiers. Aren't they allowed to carry? Yeah. Hi, Carrie. How you there? Are you doing? Are you at our house? No, I'm not out at your house. I'm way down in the Southland. And you know what the temperature is down here? The temperature down here is 98 degrees. You tell your father that. Tell him we're all going to get hardship fed. Get Carrie on here. Carrie. We're all going to get hardship fed. We're going to all get your butt? After several days, Governor Wallace was forced to step aside and Vivian Malone and James Hood were peacefully admitted to the University of Alabama. To this day, I have a letter that was written to me by Daddy on that visit, and it says, Dear Carrie, today over the objection of the governor of Alabama, two Negroes were allowed into the university, and I hope these events are long past by the time you get your pretty little head to college. And here's Daddy making sure that we were engaged and knowledgeable about what he was doing, felt a connection and felt, I think, you know, a responsibility to make sure that when we were in college, we were still knowing what was going on in the world and if there was discrimination, um, fighting it. At the Justice Department, Daddy was at the center of the storm. But at Hickory Hill, Mummy was her own force of nature. Of course, I remember as a kid, people who worked at the government were always at our house, and they all had these special plates, you know, which would mean basically that the cops wouldn't give you a ticket. And we didn't have those plates. And I remember saying to Daddy, well, why don't we have those plates? And he, him saying, are you kidding? The last thing I want people to know is who's driving that car. <laughs> so yeah, Mommy has a long history of, of dealings with cops. <laughs> But in fairness to her, when she stole those horses, she wasn't really, she was trying to save their lives. We were on a ride one day, and we heard these forlorn moans coming out of this barn. So we got off our horses and went into the shed. And in this shed were these three starving horses. And she thought, this is outrageous. And so she immediately got the groom to come and take these starving horses and bring them over to our house. Well, some people think that's stealing. A few days later, the man who had been starving the horses sued my mother for horse thievery, which at that time was a hanging offense in Virginia. <laughs> so the wife of the attorney general had to go to court and defend herself against the hanging offense. And how did she do? And she, she won, thank goodness. What did your uh, husband say? You just had a chance to talk to him. What does he think about all this, his wife, a courtroom star? <laughs> no, I'm not sure that's the way he looks at it. I don't think he's going to let me off the property again <laughs> without my keeper. <laughs> As the head of the Justice Department and the president's brother, Daddy became his ambassador to the rest of the world. Domo arigate gazaimas. Um. <laughs> Wahihi. Desne. Is that right? I think you? Why Desne? Oh, no. Kawaii Desne. There was a cute shot of you trying to speak Japanese. That wasn't so cute. That was ego destroying. It was horrible. It was so bad. You had clearly tried so hard. 
Oh, you have no idea all the way over on the plane rehearsing. Japan, Indonesia, Korea, Germany, Poland, Chile, Peru, South Africa, Kenya, the Philippines, Brazil, Italy, Ivory Coast, and Hong Kong. Every minute was filled. But whoever was in power in those countries felt they had the ear of the president. They knew they were talking to someone who could change policy. Okay, I appreciate your frankness. Appreciate it. And I think you would expect the same from me. And you're going to get it. Daddy would speak his mind. I mean, it was really uh, refreshing. And he didn't fool around. This is what I'm talking. You're talking about the United States 100 years ago. Oh, then why not make it 100 years ago? Well, do you think we stood still? <laughs> I asked uh, my wife as I was coming down whether she could think of a joke. She said, if they look at the top of your head, they'll laugh. <laughs> There is great footage of you in Poland where Daddy's signing all these signatures and then he gets a cramp, and then you start signing the signatures. <laughs> you know, I remember that trip to Poland so well because uh, instantaneously there would show up, you know, hundreds of thousands of people to see Daddy. That was a big deal because Daddy was, first of all, not given um, the visa to get to Poland for a while, and they didn't want to have any publicity for his trip there. And yet, through the underground, people found out about it, and thousands and thousands of people came. It was so wonderful to see the United States held in such high honor. When Mommy and Daddy went to Rome, the members of the press corps traveling with them gave Mommy a scooter. They presented it one day at a restaurant. It was such a cute little red scooter. So he got on it and went flying out the door and into the traffic where I hit a truck. It was really unpleasant, but I didn't know how to stop it. So what did Daddy do while you were riding the scooter? He was finishing his pasta. <laughs> he got such joy out of Mummy and some of her antics or little naughty things that she might get up to. He would just throw his head back and laugh and say, oh, Ethel, and put his hands over his eyes and his eyes to God. <laughs> My father really had the weight of the world on him. And Mommy was funny and fun and full of laughter and full of life. And she was at ease throwing parties and making him enjoy life. Any occasion that there was to have a party, there'd be a party. She had every single member of President Kennedy's cabinet knocked into the swimming pool. It was in the papers, and uh, Jack, actually, who adored my mother and loved her sense of mischief and her sense of humor, but he called her up and he said, uh, we can't have any more of that, and that was the end of pushing people in the pool <laughs> at Hickory Hill. I remember Daddy had promised uh, Mom this, like, really terrific birthday party and terrific present, and I saw Daddy and Uncle Steve go out the front door, and they rustled around in a car for a while, and they pulled out a guy, and the guy was dressed in a black tie, and they had wrapped him up in ribbons with this gigantic pink bow. They carried him in and laid him at Mum's feet, and it was Gene Kelly. I'm singing in the rain. Just singing in the rain. And she, she rips the bow off of him, and he jumped up, and he grabbed her and danced her around the dance floor, and that was Daddy's gift to Mom that she would never forget. <laughs> I'd say in the history of the country, there probably never been as unique a relationship between two brothers as the one between Daddy and Jack. It would be rare to be able to identify a team of brothers who were as close as they were and achieved as much success as they did. They had a great relationship. I think there was enormous affection between them and admiration on each of their parts. It was very funny. So often people said they couldn't understand their dialogue. 
And it was because one of them would start a sentence and the other would finish it. He knew exactly where the other one was going. From Dallas, Texas, the flash, apparently official, President Kennedy died at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time, some 38 minutes ago. It was like a tidal wave of grief to see this vibrant man with all his character and sense of fun and um, wonderful judgment was lost. Everyone was devastated. It was, uh, it was like Daddy had lost both arms. And how did you talk to him, or did you feel like you could reach out? No, I didn't, no. Was it months? It was six months of just blackness. Well, Daddy became much more withdrawn after Jack died, and he would go to his room after dinner, and he read a lot of poets. He read um, Aeschylus, Edith Hamilton on the Greeks, and he read the Bible, obviously, um, the Old Testament. And really the, the notion of how do you face tragedy, how do you go forward, and how do you make sense of your life? And I think that he tried to really feel the pain. He said, I'm going to dwell in the pain, and I'm going to understand that something terrible has happened. And I think that helped make him a really an stunning, extraordinary leader, because um, oftentimes people who are in the public life don't go deep into pain, and he was willing to do that. This is a letter he wrote two days after um, our uncle uh, Jack died. Dear Kathleen, you seem to understand that Jack died and was buried today. As the oldest of the Kennedy grandchildren, you have a particular responsibility now, a special responsibility to John and Joe. Be kind to others and work for your country. Love, Daddy. And you have to think about this. He had just had the most terrible tragedy. He had just lost his brother. He had lost his power, which is you know, the attorney general. He didn't know what was going to happen to Jackie and he didn't know where to go. And you can imagine that others in that situation might be filled with a spirit of revenge or anger or being, you know, kicking out or just so mad. And his words are just amazing to me. They are about responsibility, kindness, working for our country, and love. And now, it is my privilege and honor to introduce Robert Kennedy. sitting in the living room just watching him give the speech and the clapping continued for 17 minutes and it was just so breathtaking and it was sort of like tears coming down his eyes. that we can't just look back, that we must look forward. When I think of President Kennedy, I think of what Shakespeare said in Romeo and Juliet, uh, when he shall die, take him and cut him out in little stars, and he shall make the face of heaven so fine that all the world will be in love with night and pay no worship to the garish sun. 
there was such an outpouring of emotion and love for Jack, and it washed over Daddy. I think after the Canadians named Mount Kennedy the highest unclimbed peak in Canada after his brother, I think he knew that he needed to be the first to climb it. When did the idea first come to you to climb the mountain? I think my younger brother suggested that we both do it. Why isn't Teddy coming out? Well, that's what I'm going to find, try to find out. Here was Daddy who arrived in a business suit, changed into his mountain climbing gear, and just wanted to get right up there. Uh, it was three days of climbing up and back again. Daddy brought up a flag with the Kennedy family coat of arms, and then coins with Jack's face on them. Did he like climbing? No, he hated every moment of it. But he did it to honor Jack. was cleansing or gave him the impetus to go on and uh, start again. He started little baby steps to come out of it. But I think it was really you children who did it. And you can see it in the photographs at the time when he was playing touch football with you. In 1964, my father decided to run for the United States Senate. Over the past few weeks, many leading members of the Democratic and the Liberal Party here in the state of New York have talked to me about being a candidate for the United States Senate. Mrs. Kennedy, how do you feel about transferring your family to the state of New York? I'm looking forward to it. This was the first time he was running... On his own. Yeah. Yeah, and it was totally different, and he was... Not as comfortable. I think that the election of is of great importance, and I think Queens is a pivotal It's a long day. It's a long campaign. Whereas Jack was a born orator, nothing came naturally to Daddy. He really had to um, struggle for everything. In 1963, the people in the Plattsburgh area paid $12 million taxes school. If my opponent had his way, your area would have lost at the Stumblewoman. Campaigning was totally against his nature. How did you like it? I loved it. <laughs> <laughs> Can I tell you? Well, I just think when people think of Bob Kennedy, they think of courage. I can't think of anyone who would better represent you in the Senate of the United States. Daddy moved from behind the scenes to, you know, a very public figure in those years. And those were not easy transitions for him. Mummy lifted Daddy up. He had a lot in him, but it's hard to get that out. And you have to have that faith that she had in him. I always uh, felt, uh, having been a campaign manager before, that 90% of the talk was done by men and 90% of the work was done by women. Hello. Nice to see you. Hello. Nice to be here. Uh, thank you for wearing your button. <laughs> we had a house in New York. It was in Glen Cove, Long Island. So there were a lot of gatherings there, of hundreds of women. But I was pregnant. You were always pregnant. I know. I was just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. I mean... <laughs> For the last 14 years, Bobby's been down serving the federal government in Washington, and now he'll care for you. But the only thing is he needs you to care for him first and for you to support him. We were part of that campaign, and we went everywhere with him. We went to the Finger Lakes, we went to Syracuse and Rochester and Rye and Schenectady. We just could not wait to go campaigning, which if you talk to children of politicians, this is not a common theme whatsoever, but they always made it an adventure. So it just felt so holistic, like this was part of our life. Daddy was attacked for his decision to run for the Senate in New York. He was called a carpetbagger. Aren't you really using New York State as a kind of 
jumping off place for your own presidential ambitions? First, let me say, I would like, uh, I have really two choices uh, over the period of the last uh, 10 months. I could have retired, and, uh, <laughs> and I, my uh, father has done very well, and I could have lived off him. <laughs> Frankly, I don't need the title, because I could be called general, I understand, for the rest of my life. I've been a <laughs> And I don't need the money, and I don't need the office space. So I, I, I would just, I mean, frank as it is, and maybe it's difficult to understand in the state of New York, I like to just be a good United States senator. I like to serve. The United States senator from New York, so said the people of this state by a half a million votes. Daddy won his seat in the Senate, beating Kenneth Keating with 55% of the vote. Senator, in assessing the results of uh, the campaign, what do you attribute your success to? I think just the effort that we made in the campaign. And Ethel. Yeah. <laughs> Here is a senator from Massachusetts. He joined his younger brother, Teddy, in the Senate. It was a magical time because Daddy was very interested in ideas. He was reading the Greeks. Mommy and Daddy would take us to the theater. You know, Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton were friends. They would recite the Crispian Day speech together. I mean, there was just, there was really a sense of excitement. Mommy and Daddy also wanted us to see, you know, how other people lived. And so we'd often drive through Harlem and the Bronx and Bedford-Stuyvesant. They wanted to make sure that we didn't just think we, the world was how we saw it. We were appalled by the poverty and that nobody was paying attention to the people on the lowest rungs of the ladder. I don't think that it's acceptable, as I said before, with the gross national product that this country has, with the great amount of wealth that this country has, that we still have people who can't find jobs. We still have children who don't have enough to eat and don't have clothes to wear. Daddy was very focused on trying to do something. You know, when I was very young, he was interested in sort of justice, as in making sure that people who had ripped off their fellow workers or their employees should be brought to justice. And now he was interested in justice for the whole country. When Daddy went down to the Delta, he was just so riveted by the experience. You haven't had lunch? You haven't had lunch yet? He described how the children had distended stomachs and had sores all over their tummy because they didn't have enough to eat. He arrived home just as we were having dinner, clearly moved and emotionally exhausted, I say, from seeing such dire poverty. I remember it was a lovely, a lovely evening and the, the table in our dining room was set. And as you know, we have a really nice dining room with chandeliers and the crystal on the glasses and uh, cook to cook dinner and somebody to serve it. And Daddy walked in. I was, I was just there. And he said, I I've just been um, to Mississippi and I've seen a family who, and he would live in a room the size of this dining room. Do you know how lucky you are? And he was shaking. Do you know how lucky you are? You have to do something for our country. You have to give back. <laughs> At that time, Cesar Chavez was organizing with the grape pickers, and he was on strike. And he asked Daddy to come and see him. Senator, are you a supporter of Mr. Chavez? Is that why you're going up there? You're right. Uh, he's been on a uh, hunger strike and is uh, committed to nonviolence, and I think that's terribly important. Cesar had been on a very long fast, and Daddy wanted to be there at his side after Cesar had made such a personal sacrifice. Look at what friendship they had developed. Yeah. I think they would have been friends under any circumstances, just because they cared so much about the same kind of people. Somebody wrote on the... Uh on the pyramids, the uh, time they were being constructed, the words, uh, and no one was angry enough to speak out. 
I think people should be angry enough to speak out. I think there are injustices. I think there are unfairnesses in my own country and around the world. And I think that uh, if one feels it involved in it, that uh, one should try to do something about it. Come gather around, people, wherever you roam. And admit that the waters around you have grown. And accept it that soon you'll be drenched to the bone. If your time to you is worth saving, we'll get to the promise, then you better start swimming or you'll sink like a stone. Or the times they are a change. By the mid-1960s, race relations in the United States were badly strained. Violence had broken out in cities across America. Los Angeles, Newark, Detroit. Added to this was Vietnam and the growing anti-war movement. Do you remember when Daddy decided to run for president? Yeah, I mean, I remember we had this conversation around the dinner table, and he asked all of us, um, all the kids, what do you think about him running? And there was some discussion about Vietnam, and there was some discussion about the civil rights movement. Vietnam informed Daddy's decision to run for president. Is that right? Yes, I would say 90 percent, probably was the feeling that Johnson wasn't going to get out. Yes. And was he interacting with Johnson at that point? No. They didn't? No, he was clearly persona non grata. For 20 years, first the French and then the United States had been predicting victory in Vietnam. Once in 1962, I participated in such a prediction myself. But for 20 years, we have been wrong. The country was in such a state of miasma, and it needed his spirit. I am announcing today my candidacy for the presidency of the United States. Do you remember when he announced his run for president? Yes, where was in the Senate caucus room, where before him Jack had. So it was, it was great. I run for the presidency because I want the United States of America to stand for hope instead of despair for reconciliation of men instead of the growing risk of world war. Most of Daddy's age did not want Daddy to run. Mommy, more than anybody, knew that Daddy would be miserable if he didn't join that campaign. Daddy had entered the race late, but he started campaigning vigorously. And Mommy, who was pregnant with me at the time, joined him as often as she could. I don't think it's tolerable that young men and young women growing up in our great city are not able to find jobs. And I think whites and blacks, poor and rich, together, are to work together. This first week has taken him all across the country, to the south and to the far west. I would like to have the politics of reality and the politics of hope. You think it's going well in general? Well, I think they're winning in three primaries. Three for three isn't bad. I hate to, to burden you with questions now, but I'm just wondering, is, okay. is this laryngitis a, a result of the, the campaign and the yes, talking a lot? Is it because you've been making so many speeches? No, I think it's just the strenuous pace of the campaign. Dr. Martin Luther King, the apostle of nonviolence in the civil rights movement, has been shot to death in Memphis, Tennessee. The nation has not known such shock, nor has it been so stunned since the assassination of President Kennedy. Mummy and Daddy's campaign plane had just landed in Indianapolis when they learned of Martin Luther King Jr.'s death. Riots were breaking out in cities across the nation, and the police told them to stay in their hotel. The police did not want Daddy to go into the inner city that night, and I believe they said they wouldn't protect him, but absolutely nothing was going to stop him, because I think he thought that maybe, just maybe, he could present it in such a way that people would not riot. Ladies and gentlemen, I have some very sad news for all of you, and I think uh, sad news for all of our fellow citizens, and that is that Martin Luther King was shot and was killed tonight in Memphis, Tennessee. For those of you who are black and are tempted to fill with, be filled with hatred and mistrust against all white people, I would only say that I can also 
feel in my own heart the same kind of feeling. I had a member of my family killed, but he was killed by a white man. But we have to make an effort in the United States to get beyond or go beyond these rather difficult times. My favorite poet was Aeschylus. He once wrote, even in our sleep, pain which cannot forget falls drop by drop upon the heart until in our own day despair, against our will, comes wisdom through the awful grace of God. What we need in the United States... In the wake of King's assassination, riots broke out in more than 100 cities. But in Indianapolis, there was no such violence. I think there was a loss of hope at that time. After Jack died and then Martin Luther King was killed, many people put their final hopes in Daddy. Robert Kennedy is the only man on the current political structure that can do the job that we need done. Is there a second choice? There is no second choice as far as we're concerned. I want to uh, first... Uh, Thank my wife, Ethel, who's, uh, as all of you know, has made such a major difference in this campaign and a major difference for me. I don't think anybody could have campaigned more vigorously or thoughtfully or gone to more cities or towns or villages. And he had tremendous energy. And he really felt the need to talk to different people and to, to get his views across. Did you feel like Daddy was going to win? He had lost in Oregon, right? He lost in Oregon was the first time any Kennedy had lost, and it was not fun. Losing isn't any fun. No right. kidding. Why did I lose? Just because I didn't do well enough. I mean, I, uh, <laughs> there wasn't any, uh, I could just, uh, the only fall to blame is me. Uh, I can't, but I can't, that's me. Everybody agreed that Daddy's loss in Oregon did not bode well for the campaign. But he went on to California, and there the campaign picked up steam. Decency is at the heart of the matter, for poverty is indecent. Illiteracy is indecent. The death or maiming of a brave young man in the swamps of Asia or South Vietnam, that is indecent. We went to uh, California in June and we campaigned in Watts. We had Rafer Johnson and Rosie Greer uh, holding Daddy on the top of a convertible and we were all holding on for dear life, and everybody was just reaching up to see him and to touch him and to, to even like to wear, rip his shirt off. It was like he was a beetle. <laughs> he, was, he was just, he touched people, and they in return wanted to physically touch him. Mr. Kennedy, Mr. Kennedy, California love you. There was a lot hinging on California. I think the works. But Daddy went on to win the primary right. in California, yeah. which is such a thrilling moment, because it really seemed like yeah. he might win. The yeah, president. then there was a very optimistic feeling. A few minutes after he made his victory speech in the ballroom of the Ambassador Hotel in Los Angeles, my father was shot. Then we lost Daddy. We talked about something else. What happened was I was in California with Courtney and David and Michael campaigning, and um, uh, <laughs> um, David stayed with Daddy and Mommy to um, watch the returns, um, and uh, Michael and Courtney and I went back to the hotel and, um, and went to sleep, and the next morning I probably woke up at four or five in the morning, and I turned on the television to watch cartoons, and uh, the news, you know, just kept coming across um, about Daddy. Senator Robert Francis Kennedy died at 1.44 a.m. today. June 6, 1968. He was uh, 42 years old.
we flew back and awaked him at St. Patrick's Cathedral. And in front of St. Patrick's, there was um, hundreds of thousands of people. The crowds were eight feet thick. It was such an outpouring. It was amazing. You know, around the block, five deep at St. Patrick's. My brother need not be idealized or enlarged in death beyond what he was in life. To be remembered simply as a good and decent man who saw wrong and tried to right it, saw suffering and tried to heal it, saw war and tried to stop it. The next day, we took him down to Washington, D.C. on the train. The train ride took us seven hours because there were so many people on the tracks. It was long and hot and very sad, and just people all along with, with the signs that they had up and, and the tears in their eyes, and, and they just seemed like broken. I have just such a strong memory of all of those crowds of people. And uh, I kind of loved going through that train and seeing all those friends of our families and just feeling like we're all here together and everybody loves each other. And, and looking out the windows of that train and seeing so many different people, it just seemed like every color of the rainbow and these kind of groups of white people and these groups of black people all along the tracks. I don't know, it's a very positive, very, very positive sense in the midst of all of that horror, this kind of sense of unity and of, of love. Everybody commented at the time how extraordinary you were and strong and... Well, I don't know. A lot of wonderful children to be with. Do you think that faith helped you at that point, or it just keep going? Yes, I just wake up every morning and think of Daddy uh, up there with Jack and Joe and my parents and a lot of my brothers and sisters. Yeah. Probably arguing with him, but... <laughs> Trying to convince them to become Democrats. <laughs> When we lost Daddy, I was 11, and I uh, didn't understand it. And uh, she said to me, Daddy is so happy, nothing can take that away from him, and he's in the most joyous, abundant place. And she's joyous. While the rest of the world was grieving and the family was grieving, she saw the best in it. And she saw the best in it because her faith is so strong. And that's carried her, I believe, through everything, through... Uh, losing David and then Michael. And she so strongly believes that they're happy and free. In 1984, my brother David died from a drug overdose. He was 28 years old. And then in 1997, my brother Michael died in a skiing accident. He was 39. I remember sort of towards the end of June of that year, we went with my Uncle Teddy on a sailboat and we went around Martha's Vineyard and Nantucket Sound for a few days just to get away from everything and to be with the family. And I remember dragging behind the boat with my mother and thinking she looked very pregnant. And Teddy said something and she started laughing and laughing and laughing, you know, almost uncontrollably. And I thought, and then I thought, well, there is going to be laughter again. There is laughter, and this doesn't all have to be so dark and horrible. Although she lost Daddy, she, she did have 11 children, and she had you to fight for and live for the first six months. I was born. Yes. <laughs> that was the joy of my life. Thank you. So that was a few months. That was wonderful. A few months later. We want to uh, say how uh, happy we are uh, today, and uh, uh, I told uh, Ethel that uh, I think uh, 
Uh, Joan and I are going to take uh, this uh, baby home. We think uh, Ethel has enough of them. Uh, Joan, anyway. <laughs> And then you guys went to Arlington with me? Yeah. And how was that? Well, bittersweet, you know? Yeah. Doggy? You want Look how she is. is. It's Rory. Can you say your name? Teddy had asked what your name would be. And I said, Rory, the last of the Irish kings. And he said, oh. Well, you need to teach her, Rory, Rory, grab the dory. There's a herring in the bay. <laughs> forget the dory, Rory. Oh, yeah, the forget that. The got, got away. <laughs> <laughs> you remembered more than I did. By the time I was born, part of the story was already over. And another different story was just beginning. My name is Christopher. Coming about, right now we're coming about, the sheets are rattling, Mommy's turning that wheel. We're going to have Douglas Kennedy speak on the recorder, and he is a great guy. This is Douglas speaking. Uh, I'm four and a half, and I love Mommy. At home, how much did things change after Daddy died? I think the only way to deal with 11 children, with their friends, with 30 or 40 first cousins, this with structure and discipline and routine and organization. And mommy brought structure and discipline and routine and organization to every aspect of our lives. It's interesting because, especially after daddy died, we learned sports from mommy. And she taught us to ski. She taught us to play football. She made sure that we weren't going to sit around and feel sorry for ourselves. Bless us, O Lord, in these gifts which we are about to receive from the advent of Christ our Lord. Amen. David called in today. And do you know what the temperature is where he's working? 117 in La Paz, California. She sent the older kids to places in our country and around the world so that we could understand and, and live with different cultures. So Kathleen went and lived on an Indian reservation, and Joe lived with a family in Spain, and Bobby lived with a group of people in Africa. Uh, Courtney and I went and worked on a farm in Utah. David worked with Cesar Chavez. You know that he works 10 hours a day for eight cents an hour. So are you looking forward to doing something like that? Wouldn't you like to work for Cesar Chavez? Sure. Not for eight cents an hour. <laughs> Not for eight cents an hour. Imagine trying to raise your family on that one. Although I think they were equal partners, my mother took a step behind and, and she was supporting daddy. And after we lost him, I think she felt the need to become more of a leader. She continues in a wonderful way to help carry on a lot of daddy's causes. You know, she'll go walk with Cesar Chavez. Cesar has broken his fast from the hand of Ethel Kennedy. She became a force of nature in her own right and was questioning authority and calling congressmen and governors and senators to say, why aren't things being made better? She put so much energy into the Bedford-Stuyvesant Restoration Program. She started the Robert F. Kennedy Center for Justice and Human Rights to carry forward this unfinished work. The Robert F. Kennedy Center which my mother founded in 1968, helps support journalists, writers, and human rights activists who carry on my father's work. Over the last 20 years, she's gone on human rights delegations to Namibia, Albania, Czechoslovakia, Haiti, Hungary, Kenya, Mexico, Northern Ireland, Poland, South Africa. Seeing our mother walk in his absence along that same path really uh, impacted all of us. That gave us not the obligation,